There are two types of loops. One of them is counted loops, where you know how many times you would like to run a certain action. And the other one is a conditional loop, where you run a set of statements so long as a condition is true. Okay. And in MATLAB, the, an example for counted loops is for loop. And the conditional loop is a while loop. In other programming languages, you may, you may have more than one of these statements to perform counted or conditional loops. And you can actually um, simulate a for loop using a while loop. So while loop is actually uh, sufficient to perform all the loops that you need. But it's just easier to use a for loop when you know how many times you would like to run a for loop for. Uh, the syntax for the for loop is um, as follows. You say for one or more spaces. And then you would have a loop variable, OK? The loop variable will count how many times you would like to run the loop for. It will run using the values in this range vector, <coughs> OK? So this range can be any expression that generates a vector. It can be zero or more elements inside. So if you have an empty vector, then the loop will not execute. If you have only a single element, the loop will execute once, and so on. Okay. Some examples are as follows. Uh, the first example will take i, which is the loop variable, and it will assign values from 1 to 6. So in the first execution of the for loop, i will be 1. All right? So imagine a box named i. Um, it will take values from 1 all the way to 6. The first time that you are executing this for loop, the first entry will be copied into i, 1, and then you'll print hello. And then when it's done, when it hits the end statement, it'll go back and copy the next entry, perform the statement again, which will print hello again. So it will print hello six times. This is equivalent to uh, the example on the right, where I wrote the range expression explicitly instead of using the colon operator. Okay. As you can see in these two examples, I'm not really using the value of i. i is only used to count over a set of numbers. I, I might have as well said 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 20. Uh, the result would have been the same. Okay, because inside this for loop, I am not making use of the value of i. All right, so any any value of i will will do the same thing in this exam in these two examples. In the third example, um, the function is the same as the first two, except that I am writing the entire for loop in a single line. When you write things in a single line, you need to separate them with semicolons. Okay. <coughs> You can actually use commas too, but semicolons are preferred. If you put uh, commas to separate statements, it's equivalent to put it's equivalent to not putting a semicolon at the end. So MATLAB will print out the result of each. So use semicolons whenever you can. In the last two examples, I'm making use of the value of i in the for loop. Okay. So again, I have a box where I'm going to keep the value of i, and it'll take values from 1 to 6. The first time I'm running over this for loop, i will contain 1. It'll display 1, OK? And then it'll go back to the top of the for loop, copy the next element, which is 2, print 2, 3, all the way to 6, OK? So this for loop will print numbers from 1 to 6. When you have a matrix instead of a vector as your range, so here I have a 2 by 3 matrix. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. MATLAB will take the values in each column to be the next range, OK? So the numbers 1 and 4 will be copied into i. 1, 4. 
In the first iteration of the for loop, I will contain a column vector that contains numbers 1 and 4, and this I will print 1, 4. Okay? And in the next iteration, it will print 2, 5. And in the last iteration, it will print 3, 6. And then it's done. It's going to get out of the for loop and uh, do whatever else you have after the for loop. All right? Let's do a quick exercise. Um, you are asked to write a function running sum that takes an integer n and returns the sum of numbers from 1 to n. Let's go to MATLAB. So to solve this problem, I need a for loop to iterate over numbers 1 to n, okay? So let's start that for i equals 1 to n. So at each iteration of this for loop, the variable i, the box i, will, will contain numbers 1 to n. And what do I want to do with these numbers? I want to add them up. So I need another variable that will store the sum of numbers from 1 to n. Initially, it will be 0. So I start from 0, and then I say s equals s plus i. The first time I am running this for loop, the value of i will be 1, and that will be added to the value in s. And then I'll go back to the top. It will get the next number, put it into i, which is 2, and then add that to s, OK? Let me show the workspace. Workspace is shown. Where's my workspace here? Go to the bottom. There you go, that's better. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to save this file and then call it running sum. Let's um, add the numbers 1 to 5. I'll put a breakpoint here. Okay. So MATLAB will stop at the line that I clicked on. And then I'll hit F10 to move on to the next line. And you can see the value of S is 0. The value of N is 5. And then in the first iteration of for loop, when I first enter the for loop, the value of I will be 1. Okay. And the next statement will take the value of i, add it to s, and then put it back into s. So the value of s will be 1. And I'll go back to the top of the for loop. Now the value of i is 2. It'll add it to s. So s will be 3. Go, go up again. The value of i will be um, 3. Add it to s. s becomes 6 and so on for all the way 1 to 5, and then the result is 15. There are no more numbers in the for loop to iterate on, so I finish um, putting them into i and running the statements so there are no more numbers to iterate on, and I'm exi exiting the function because there are no other statements in the function, and the result is 15. Okay. Now, you are not limited with a single um, statement. You can have multiple statements in your for loop, such as let's do i equals i times 2, which will not really change anything in this um, program because the value of i is being uh, reinitialized at the, end, at the beginning of each for loop. All right. Now, we are asked to change this function running sum, so it takes two arguments from n2, and again returns the, num the sum of numbers. Instead of starting from 1, it will start from from, and then go all the way to 2. Let's finish that. Um, so I'm going to change this input argument, so it takes two inputs from n2. And all I have to do is change this um, range to go uh, from numbers from n2. Okay. So whatever from n2 I provide, it'll go 
it will take those numbers. Let's do running sum. 1 to 5, I should get the same answer, 15. I'm not going to debug it anymore. I get 15. If I say 2 to 5, I'll get 14. Okay. 2 to 2, I get 2. 2 to 1, what would I get with 2 to 1? So what are the sum of numbers going from 2 all the way up to 1? 0, right? Because I've set up my range, so it goes from 2 to 1. And you have no numbers between in that range. Um, if you wanted to get numbers um, between 2 and 1, decrementing the number, then you would do 2 minus 1 all the way to 1. That will give you two numbers, okay? We have an additional requirement that if only the from is provided, then we would return the sum of numbers from 1 to from, okay? So what I want to do is I want to be able to say running sum 5 just as I was able to do that before, okay? So if only a single number pro is provided, I want the lower number to be assumed to be 1, okay? So let's see what happens when I run this function with a single argument. When I say running sum 5, the value of 5 is going to be copied into the variable from. The variable 2 will not exist because it's not provided. Okay. So at this point, if you look at the workspace, you see the variable from, which has a value of 5, and you do not, you do not see the variable 2. If I keep executing this function, in the next line, MATLAB will give an error saying that the variable 2 does not exist. Okay. How do I check if a variable exists? There was, there was a function to do that. So how do I check if um, a variable called x is present in my workspace? I would say if exist, well actually let me show you the function first, I would say exist x variable. Does a variable named x exist? It will be 0 if it does and 1 if it doesn't. I mean, sorry, the other way around. It will be 0 if it doesn't exist and 1 if it does exist. So let's say x is equal to 5. If I run this again, it will give me 1 because now I have x in the workspace. I can use the same logic inside the function to test whether a variable 2 is present. So I would say if exist 2 variable. So this checks if the 2 variable exists. I'm actually more interested in the case when it does not exist. So I put a negation sign in, in, at the front, on the front that checks whether this two variable does not exist. And if it does not exist, what I will do, I will take the value inside from and put it into two and reset from to become one. Okay? So now let's rerun this function with a single value, running sum five. So what happens, again, 5 is copied into the variable from, and the two variable does not exist. So this if statement will, the condition in the if statement will evaluate true. So I'm going inside the if statement, and I'm taking the value inside from, putting it into the variable 2. So you can see in the workspace that 2 became 5, and I'm resetting from to be 1. Okay? And the rest of the function will execute as if I called running sum 1, 5. And it will give me 15. F5, I get my answer 15. Okay? So this is how you can check whether a variable has been provided to your function, whether an argument has not been provided to your function. And this is how you can set default values to input arguments. Okay?
All right, so this was an important programming concept where you specified default function arguments. So if the user does not specify an argument, how do you uh, set a default value to it? You would check whether it does not exist and um, set it accordingly. All right, now we are asked again to change this function running from so that the arguments from N2 can be specified in any order. So what I mean by that is if I say running sum 1, 2, I should get 3. But I also want to get 3 when I run 2 and 1. So again, you, it, you would um, have, a, have an if statement. You would say if from is greater than 2. So if that's the case, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to swap their values. Let's use a temporary variable temp equals from, from equals 2, 2 equals temp, end. And that's how I can swap the values of from and to using another, a third um, variable called temp. Make sense? Are you guys all with me? Is it clear? Good. I see some nodding heads, which is okay, I guess. So now if I run um, my function again, I get three again. All right? Okay. Another exercise. Uh, write a function my factorial that returns n factorial. Of course, don't, of course, don't do not use the built-in factorial function. That would be considered uh, cheating in this in this exercise. And you must use for loops. So let's do my factorial uh, function. It'll return a single va value f. It'll take a single input argument n. And we want n factorial to be, to be returned. Okay. So the easy answer would be uh, to cheat and do this. f equals n factorial and we are done. It'll work correctly. 3 equals 6. 4 equals 24. But we, we want to do this using for loops. It's the same um, as what I did with the summation. But now I'm, go I'm going to do multiplication. So for, for i equals 1 to n, I'm going to initialize a, va a value of f to be what? 0 or what else? Or something else? 1, right? So if I multiply it, it will not be 0. f uh, equals f times i. N. So I am iterating over numbers uh, from 1 to n. And for each of them, I'm multiplying them into f. Okay, so the first time that the for loop executes, it'll be, um, i will be 1. 1 times 1 is equal to 1. It'll be placed into f. The second time it executes, it'll be 2 times 1. The uh, result will be 2 placed into f. The third time it executes, the value of i will be 3. 3 times 2 is 6. will be placed into f, okay? And uh, you'll get the same answer as you did before. Now, you can, you can reduce the number of iterations that this for loop executes by going from 2 to n, because uh, the first one is sort of redundant. Okay. All right, now you are asked to change this uh, my factorial function so that it can take a vector of integers. Instead of a single integer, um, we want to take a vector of integers. integers and return another vector, the resulting vector, where each element is the factorial of the corresponding input element, okay? Now, uh, let's see how MATLAB's factorial function runs. If I provided a, a range of numbers, let's say for a number of numbers, 4 and 6, you get a resulting vector of the same size, where each element is the factorial of the corresponding element uh, that you provide as the input. So 4 factorial is 24, 6 factorial is 720, and you get a vector uh, with two elements inside. And we want to do the same thing in our my factorial function. Okay? So what I need to do, I need to check whether um, more than one number is provided. 
And which function can I use to do that? So which function can I use to check whether um, the number of elements in n is greater than 1? How do I get the number of elements in n? NumL. Good. So I check whether NumL is greater than n. If it is greater than n, then I will have another for loop. For, um, let's say, j. Actually, I can use, let me use j instead of, let's use k so it doesn't look confusing on the screen. For k equals 1 to numel n. Um, f k equals my factorial k and else that. So what am I doing here? I'm first checking whether more than one number is provided. Okay? Whether number of elements in n is greater than one. And if so, for each number in n, so this is a counter on the number of elements in n. So in, the, in this case, it will be 2. If I call my factorial 4n6, uh, the number of elements will be 2, and the values that k will take will be 1 and 2. And then for each of those, I am running the my factorial function again on a single number. Okay? Actually, this should be um, nk instead of k. And then I'm placing the result of that into the output vector. And let's just execute to see if I get the um, correct answer. And I get it. And let's debug it to see what happens as we go. So the first time that I enter this function, the value of n will be 4 and 6. It's a vector. It has more than one element. So I'll go inside this if statement. And then I execute uh, a for loop on numbers ranging from 1 and 2. So that will be the values of k. The first time I run it, k will be 1. The second time I run it, k will be 2. And then for each of those, I take n k. So I take the first element of n and then the second element of n in the next run of the for loop. And I take that and I run the same function again. Okay? So let's now step inside this execution. So what happens is MATLAB will place a sort of a bookmark right here. So this is where I was left in the previous iter in the previous execution of this function. So you can think you can think of it as you had a function, but now you uh, you call the same function on a different page, and then you have to be done with that next page, and then go back to your previous page and continue where you were left. Okay. So in this case. Uh, n will be 4. All right, the value of n is 4. Number of elements of n is 1, so it's not greater than 1. It's going to go into the else part, and the else part finds the factorial just as we did before. 4 factorial is 24, and then it returns to where you were left um, in your bookmark, okay? In the previous function where you were left, you were left inside a for loop with k equals 1. You place the result into fk. Now you execute the for loop again for k equals 2. And again, you are going to go inside the same function, find 6 factorial, which is 720. And then you, you place the result into fk, you place the result into f2. And now if you look at the result, f contains 24 and 720, and you are done. You print, uh, MATLAB prints the result. Okay? So that's, that's called a recursive function call. So you recursively call the function within itself. All right?
Okay. Um, if I use more than one number, what would happen for six? It should still work the same way. Okay. So what happens inside this for loop, and you can see a little um, pink underline on, under the F, and MATLAB gives you a warning saying that the variable F appears to change size on every loop iteration. Consider pre-allocating for speed. Um, in the first iteration of this for loop, MATLAB will say F1 uh, equals 24, because that's, that's the result on the right-hand side. Okay? And then the second time the for loop iterates, MATLAB will take 720 and place it in the second box of F, which did not exist. So MATLAB will extend the size of the box F so it, um, so it can accommodate two numbers. So each time you iterate over the for loop, MATLAB extends the box F with another element and places the new value inside. Reallocating the box to increase its size is a, cost, is a, uh, is a costly action. It takes time for MATLAB to do that. The better way of doing this is to allocate as much space as you need at the end and just fill the, fill the numbers in after you pre-allocate them. So what does pre-allocate mean in this case? You would say F, uh, if you have five numbers to fill in, you would say F uh, equals zeros one five, okay? So you just create a zero, a matrix with entries uh, zero inside. So you would say F equals zeros one numeral n. Okay. So now, when I first execute this function, MATLAB will go into the um, for loop, and F is already created to have five elements. So MATLAB will just replace the value zero with the new result, instead of trying to extend uh, the size of the box each time. And that would um, give you faster execution. Any questions? Okay. Um, there's a related concept to the, this if-else statement inside functions. So if, if you want to do something, uh, if you want to execute the rest of the function only when a condition is met, what you would do is you would check the condition and then if that condition is true, you would say return. So what return does is whenever MATLAB hits return, it will stop executing the rest of the function. And it will return from this function. So effectively, you are basically saying, if, that, if this is true, perform this. If not, perform that. So if not, MATLAB will already go in here and never see this return statement. Okay? Make sense? All right, so return is a keyword you can use to exit out of the function. And you would usually do this um, in recursive calls or when there's an error in the, in the input arguments and you don't really want to run the rest of the function for the uh, given input arguments. Like you would print an error saying I cannot calculate the, the square root of negative numbers and return after that so uh, you don't perform the rest of the function. All right, another example. Write a function myprod that returns the product of the elements in B and do not use the built-in function uh, prod. Edit myprod.m. So in this my factorial function, um, I actually th there's a code that goes over the elements of uh, n. So it'll basically be the same thing. Let me just copy and paste and modify around a little bit. Um, P equals my prod v. It takes a vector instead of a single number. 
and initially the value of b will be 1 and for each value of b the output will be p times bi okay so at each iteration I take the value of um, the box inside v <coughs> and I multiply it with the p so I don't need this um, it's a single result so I don't need to index it and they'll give you the the multiplication of all the elements in V. So if I say my prod 5, I'll get a 5. If I say my prod 2, 5, I'll get a 10. Okay? I can actually use this function to calculate factorials by giving a range of numbers from 1 to 5 or uh, 1 to any other number. It'll give me the second number factorial because I'm basically multiplying this range of numbers. Okay? All right. Any questions? You can have any um, complex statement inside the for loop. You can have other for loops or you can have if statements. So in this example, we'll combine ifs with loops. And we are asked to write a function my min, which will take a vector v and returns the minimum value in that vector. MATLAB already has a function that will do this, but we are learning how to use for loops. That's why we need to do it ourselves. Edit my min function m equals my min v. It takes a vector of numbers and returns a single number. Now, when I first start, I have to initialize uh, m. So let's say this is v, and m is a single box that will contain the minimum value in this vector. I'm going to have a for loop that will look at each of these uh, elements of v, compare them with m. If an element of v that I, uh, that I check is smaller than m, I will update m. Okay. So let's consider the values 5, 2, 1, uh, 6, 10. In the for loop, I will look at this number, 5. And since m is currently empty, I'm going to put 5 in it. In the next iteration, I will look at 2. 2 is smaller than 5. I will update this m. In the next iteration, I will take a look at 1. Update M, place 1 inside. 6 is not greater than 1. 10 is not greater than 1. And my result will be 1. Okay? So let's write that in MATLAB. For I equals 1 to numel V. Initially, M will be an empty vector. So under what condition should I update M? There are actually two conditions here. The first one is when V I is smaller than m. So if the item that I'm currently looking at is smaller than my current minimum, I will update the minimum. <coughs> the other case is when m is empty. So I will say or is empty m. Another way of checking if m is empty would be numel m equal equals zero. All right. Using the is empty function is more efficient, so let's do that. <coughs> and if this is true, then I will update my current minimum to be the new value that I've checked. Okay. Now I have one error here. Does anybody see it in this if statement? So let's run it. My min two five one six ten. 
So when I execute this, the values inside B, uh, the current item is going to be 1. Uh, sorry, it's, it's going to be 2 because I'm looking at the first element in V. Okay, so the value of I is 1. The value of VI is 2. All right, the first element in, um, in V. And then the value in M is empty. So there's currently no values inside M. And MATLAB will give an error because I cannot compare a number with an empty vector. Okay? And let's check. And uh, it says operands to the OR or AND operators must be convertible to logical scalar values. Um, so MATLAB wants both sides to be a scalar value, but the left side is an empty um, result. Okay? So what I need to do is I need to take this is empty and put it on the left. So that will be the first thing that MATLAB will check. All right? So MATLAB will check if M is empty. If this evaluates to, evaluates to true, then the rest of the evaluation is not necessary, and MATLAB will not even look at it. Right? Because uh, true or anything else is going to result in true. So... Once this portion evaluates to true, you no longer need to evaluate the rest of the statement. Okay? In the case when M is not true, so when you have a false on one side of the OR operator, then you need to look at the right-hand side to see whether the result will be true or false. Okay? So when you have OR... If the left-hand side evaluates to true, MATLAB skips the left right-hand side and goes in the if statement. A similar logic applies for the and. So if you have if um, x and y, if x is false, then MATLAB will skip the rest because it already knows that the result will be false. If x is true, then you still need to look at y to, um, to get the result of X and Y. So using this trick, um, I can avoid calculation of this um, smaller than operation when M is empty, because when is M is empty, the left-hand side will be true, and I'm going to go into the if statement, and a value will be placed in the M, and M will no longer be empty in the next iteration. All right? So let's run this, my min, and you get your result 1. Let's do minus 10, and you get your value, okay? Any questions about this solution? No. Another example, you are asked to write a function input numbers that asks the user to enter a number n times and returns a vector of all the numbers that the user enters. And again, uh, the concept that we will take care of is the pre-allocation, edit input numbers function. It will return a vector v. It will take a single integer n. So I can give any names to the input and output variables, but it's, there are some standards, and it helps to... Um, keep track of whether it's a number or a vector or a matrix and so on. So if I say n, it's usually a single number. If I say v, it's a vector of numbers, okay? And you, you, might, you might come up with your own conventions when you're writing your code. Um, so I will iterate over numbers from 1 to n. Each time I will ask the user to enter a number. And I will take the result and put it in the i. And let's run it, input numbers, let's ask for three numbers, enter a number four, enter a number eight, nine, and you get a vector that contains the numbers that the user entered, okay? Again here, uh, you see that MATLAB underlines um, the variable V, complaining that it changes size at every iteration. So you can pre-allocate this vector with the largest number that you'll need. So we will need um, 
and numbers to be stored in this vector and it will execute in the same manner but a little bit faster okay. <clears throat> as I said you can put any uh, valid MATLAB statement inside the for loop you can put other for loops inside the for loops and those are called nested for loops and this the one that's outside is called the outer loop and the one that's inside is called the inner loop um, let's write a function print rectangle that takes the values r and c which are the number of rows and the number of columns and prints a box of stars uh, using r and c and you see an example here and there's also a homework problem where you're asked to print a parallelogram yep. so let's do edit print rectangle function Am I returning anything as a result of this function? Not really, I'm just printing it, right? So there's no uh, output argument. I can either say empty equals or I can just uh, not write anything. Print rectangle. It takes two arguments, R and C, and I will have a for loop that goes from 1 to R and another for loop that goes from 1 to C. So I use small r to represent the number of uh, the row number I am at. So initially it will be one, and in the next iteration it will be two, three, and so on, all the way to the number of rows I have. And similarly for c, I will represent the number of columns. Um, so all I have to do is print a star inside the inner loop. Okay. Am I missing something? am I missing here? So if I do print rectangle 3, 4, what will I get? So MATLAB will execute the for loop. Uh, the outer for loop will be executed for numbers between 1 and 3. And for each of those iterations, the inner for loop will execute for numbers 1 to 4. And I'm printing a star. So I'm, ba um, I'm basically printing 4 stars. And then in the next iteration of R, I will iterate, I will print four more stars, and in total I will print 12 stars all in one line, okay? So what I need to do is, after I printed the columns, after I print four stars, I would need to print a new line. And now I have a um, rectangle, okay? So let's... Um, debug this code. So in the first iteration, the value of r will be 1. And you can look at the workspace to keep track of the values of r. And I enter the uh, inner for loop, the value of c will, will be 1. Printed as star. You can see the star in the command window. Okay. And the next iteration of the inner for loop I print another star, and in total I printed four stars because the values of C were going from one to four. And I print my new line, go back to the top of the outer for loop, and do it again for R equals two. Okay, so four more stars and a new line, and do it again for R equals three. And I print four more stars, I am done with the outer for loop, and I am out. Okay. All right, now let's write a function that prints a triangle um, where r is the height of the triangle with one star in the first row and r stars in the last row. So let's just copy this code. Um, edit print triangle. Now I need a single argument, single input argument. Okay, so now Again, the outer for loop can go from 1 to R. But the number of stars that I print is going to depend on the row number I am at. So when I'm printing the first row, R will be 1. And I'm printing a single star. In the second row, R is equal to 2. I'm printing 2 stars. 
and c is the variable c is iterating in the inner for loop to print each of those stars so the value of c should go from 1 to r in each row make sense let me see one nod good i see one i see one all right so let's change this code and the value of uh, C will go from 1 to the number of row, to the row number I am at. In the first iteration of the outer for loop, the value of R will be 1. The values of C will be 1 to 1. So it's only a single one. A single star will be printed. In the second iteration of the outer for loop, the value of R will be 2. The values that C will take are going to be 1 and 2 that will give me two stars okay so let's uh, run it print triangle three five ten and so on okay all right um, let's solve this problem what will the following code print so it's a nested for loop and uh, it's printing the values of i and j with a formatted string. So you need to keep track of what values i take and what values j take for each value of i. So it helps if you um, have boxes like this that you can update for i and j. For the first time I execute this function, this piece of code, uh, the value of i will be 1. Okay. So let me write it out clear. Um, it will be 1, 2, and 3 for each iteration, and this one will be 1 and 2. And the value of j, when I enter the second um, if for loop, the inner for loop, it will be 1. And the fprintf will say i equals 1, comma, j equals 1. And then I'll go back to the inner for, uh, to the inner for loop. J will take the value 2. I is still 1 because I have not uh, gone all the way to the top of the in outer for loop. Okay? And then I'll print I equals 1, J equals 2. Now this for loop is done. The inner for loop is done because I went over the values that J can possibly take. Now I need to iterate over the uh, outer for loop. I took care of uh, i equals 1. Now I need to take care of i equals 2. And I start over with values of j with 1. So I'll print i equals 2, j equals 1. And execute again i equals 2, j equals 2. And then go um, iterate over the outer loop again. i will be 3, j will be 1. And I will be 3, J will be 2, okay? And this is what it will print. So you need to be able to uh, take a code like this and trace it and find the output, okay? So in the return part of the midterm, uh, you can expect problems like this, where you would be given a piece of code and you would uh, need to find the output, okay? Let's write a function that prints uh, a multiplication table and returns a matrix M. Um, well, it doesn't print the multiplication table, it just calculates the matrix, so it'll return, it'll, it will not print anything, where Mij is equal to I times J. So let's construct that. This will be matrix M. And let's say I equals one, I equals two for the second row j equals 1 for the first column, j equals 2 for the second column, j equals 3 for that. So we are expected to generate a matrix like this. Okay, so a multiplication matrix. So you need uh, nested for loops. Should be pretty straightforward to set up. You need, you need to return a matrix M. That takes a single, that takes two arguments, R and C, and 1 to R, for C equals 1 to C. Now I need to 
place a value in one single element of the matrix M. So I will put a value in the rth row and seed column of M, and that value will be r times c. It may be more helpful if you guys return if you guys replace r with i and c with j, so you have the same letters as the question. So you'll get the same result. Okay. Changing the variable names does not change the results so, so long as you consistently change all the variable names. Now if I go under this M, which is underlined, um, it, MATLAB complains that this variable was not pre-allocated. I can easily fix that by allocating a matrix with zeros. It'll have R, R rows and C columns. Okay. Now multi-table 3 by 3 is going to give me a multiplication table um, that has 3 rows and 3 columns, 3 rows and 4 columns, okay? Any questions? All right. So, uh, I mean, the for loop syntax was extremely simple. I, I showed you the syntax in one slide, but um, you guys really need to practice to learn um, how to use these um, constructs. So in the next example, we'll write a function my math sum that will return the sum of all elements in the matrix M. And we will use nested for loops. Edit my matrix sum function. It will return a single value S. And it'll take a matrix M. I need to iterate over all the rows of in M. Um, so to be able to run, iterate over all the rows of M, I need to figure out how many rows it has and how many columns it has. And I can do that using the size function. And um, 1 to R for J equals 1 to C. Okay. So I'm running over all the rows and all the columns. And I need a um, variable s to keep the sum. And s would be equal to s plus mij. It's very similar to what we did with when um, we were dealing with vectors. So let's um, give it a matrix. And it'll give us the sum of all the elements in the matrix. Okay. All right, now there's another way to solve this problem, which is co just considering M as a linear vector. Remember, we, we were able to uh, handle any matrix using linear indexing. So let me just keep this bottom portion, and I can just re say return here uh, so it will not affect uh, the result. I would say for I equals one to number of elements in M. I no, actually no longer need this, um, need the RNC. I would say S equals S plus M. Now I need to use linear indexing. I need to access the matrix M as if it were a vector. And I'll get the same result. Okay? So both of these codes will do the same thing. Now we are asked to uh, create a random 10,000 by 10,000 matrix M and calculate the my math sum and figure out how long it takes MATLAB to calculate the sum. So let's say M equals random 10,000 by 10,000. It takes a while for MATLAB to create it. And to figure out how long a set of statements take, you use two functions. One of them is called tick that will start the timer. And then you would perform your statements. The next time you call talk, it'll give you the time elapsed since the last time you called tick. Okay. So if I say tick talk, it's um, 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Okay. 
So now when I, when I click, uh, when I write tick, the amount of time that, I, that it takes for me to write the code is also, also goes into the total time. Okay. So the safer way of measuring time would be to write the entire statement in one line. Okay. Or if you, are, um, if you have this in a script, then the time it takes for you to write the code is not um, taken into consideration. If you are working in the command window, you need to make sure that tick and talk are in the same line uh, so that you are not spending time to enter the statements in between. All right, so let's, let's try to see how long it takes for MATLAB to calculate the sum. And it took 1.92 seconds. Let's go back and try the um, matrix version. Test equals zero. And it took 3.5 seconds. So indexing using linear indexing was faster than indexing using matrix indexing. Okay. Now remember that MATLAB what would store uh, matrices column-wise. So what happens if I store this matrix one, two, three, four, five, six. MATLAB will, in memory, store it as a linear vector. One, two, three, four, five, six. And when I'm running for loops, where the outer for loop iterates over the rows, so I'm executing this first row first. So MATLAB will take this number and add it to the sum. And then jump, in memory, take this fourth number and add it to the sum. And jumping in memory is more costly. So uh, it's, it takes time compared to going over the elements one by one. If I did column-wise indexing, um, where I, where in my outer loop, I go over the first column, and in my inner loop, I go over each row. In that case, I would not be jumping over the uh, numbers, and I would be going in sequence. So let's see if that makes a difference in the timing. So previously I had 3.5 seconds. And if I take this and make it the outer loop, so in, in each of the outer loop, now I am taking the first column, and then the second column, and so on. And in the inner loop, I would be taking the numbers in sequence. As, as uh, they are stored in memory. And now it's much faster. It's um, about four times faster. All right. And we already showed um, this. And now the question is, can you rewrite the, your function to contain a single for loop, which we already did using linear indexing? And linear indexing may or may not be faster than um, going through the matrix in sequence where your, where your outer loop contains columns. Any questions? All right. When I am writing examples, I will um, usually do outer loop to have the rows just because it's uh, easier to think about it, to think about the problem that way. But in problems where you really care about speed, you should um, move the columns to outer loop. Okay? So long as it doesn't change, change your result. This was a simple example. I could just uh, copy and paste the for loop header, and you'll get the same answer. One is faster than the other. Okay? All right, just, just like I was able to place if statements inside, the, inside a single loop, I can also do the same thing for nested loops. Uh, now, in this function, I'm asked to uh, calculate the sum only when the numbers are positive. So I'm trying to find the sum of positive elements in M. Uh, let me copy and paste this uh, function and edit 
my math sum if positive function s now in this for loop I need to write an additional if statement I will only add the current value of mij if it is a positive number that's all I have to do to solve this problem okay now let's try to see if it works minus 5 5 minus 7 9 I should get 12 sorry I should get 14 which I do so the negative ones are not added only the positive numbers will be added which satisfy this if condition and they will be added to s okay any questions about for loops so far because we're gonna move on to while loops which are conditional loops so in for loops I was running the for loop over a range of numbers or over a vector of numbers I actually did not show you how to do it for a range of numbers uh, over the vector. Let me show you that quickly. All right, here um, in this my min function, I was taking i to be numbers from 1 to the length to the number of elements in v. I can actually take this to be v directly instead of going over the number of elements. So in this case, the entries in V will go into the variable I, and I can replace this VI with I. So instead of taking I to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to the number of elements in V, I'm actually taking the values inside V and place each of them into the variable I. And the result, the result will, of course, not change. Now let's move on to the while loops. Um, in the while loops, instead of running over a set of elements or counting for a number of elements, I will have a condition that evaluates to true or false. And so long as this condition is true, I will perform a, a set of actions. And you would usually use uh, for while loops when you do not when you don't know how many times your loop will execute. If this condition never becomes false, then MATLAB will continually run this while loop, and that's called an infinite loop. And an example of infinite loop is when you say while true, and then put a semicolon and then end, so your action is empty. There are no actions, but the uh, while loop will execute infinitely. And you will not get the result. To break out of um, infinite loops, you can do control C. And it'll give you back the command prompt. Also, when you are running um, some functions that execute for a long time, you can again um, hit control C. So this one was taking 3.5 seconds. I can do control C to break it so I don't have to wait for it. Okay. All right. Let's do an example uh, where I find the first integer n and it's factorial such that its factorial is higher than, is greater than this number high. So factorial greater than 5,000. 540 as a factorial and 7 because 7 factorial equals 5040. Now I don't I do not know beforehand how many times this loop will execute. So I will use a while loop. Uh, factorial greater than high. It returns two out arguments n and f where n factorial equals f and it takes a single argument high. So the condition that 
I will run the loop is based on the value high. Let's start f equals 1. So long as f is smaller than high, I will execute this while loop. Okay. And I will multiply f times n. Place it into f. And let's initialize n to be 1. N. So in the first iteration, f will be smaller than high because 1 is smaller than 5,000. And then I take the value of n, multiply it into f. In the second iteration, I want n to be 2 instead of 1. So I need to add this n equals n plus 1. So each iteration of the while loop will multiply n into f to calculate its factorial and increment the value of n. And as soon as the value of f becomes larger or equal to high, I will exit out of this while loop. So while loop only executes when this condition is met. So factorial greater than high. 5,000 will give me 7, will give me 8. Uh, all right, I need to do a fix. It'll give me one more than what I need. That's 7 factorial. Okay. Um, now I get 7, I get an F, 7 and 50, 40, okay. Make sense? So I needed this uh, last statement because um, when N was 7, f factorial will be 50 40 but then i'm also incrementing n all right and then n will become 8 so when i'm done i have to decrement 1 from n another way of doing it is to change the order in which i increment n and multiply it into f if i do that then i don't need to decrement n at the end so let's try it now. I get the same answer. All right. Any questions? Okay. Rewrite the following for loop using a while loop. Remember I said you can take any for loop and write uh, a while loop that will do exactly the same thing. So let's try that. So this for loop will execute for numbers between 1 and 10. So I have a variable i where it's first 1. So I will initialize it to 1, i equals 1. And so long as i is smaller than or equal to 10, I'm going to do this fprintf statement. So exactly the same as uh, this fprintf. Then I will increment i equals i plus 1. So that's the answer. The first time I'm executing this while loop, the value of i will be 1. I'll print it, and then increment the value of i. It will be 2. I'll print it, and so on. All right? Okay. You can use while loops to do error checking, where you read something from the user, and make sure it uh, satisfies what you need. If it doesn't, you will keep asking the user uh, for the same input. And in this case, we are writing an input positive number where the user is asked to enter a positive number. If the user enters, enters a negative number, they'll be asked again. Let's try the input positive number. Function input positive number. And then I'll return the positive number that I, that I read. Um, while n is negative number, 
I will say n equals input positive numbers. Sorry. Uh, input enter positive number. Okay. So what am I missing here? So if I run this, MATLAB already has a, um, a has a warning here, but can you guys tell me what I need to do to fix it? So the first time that I run this input positive number function, MATLAB will compare the value of n with 0. What, what's the value of n? It does not exist yet, right? So I'll get an error. So I need to initialize the value of n. n is equal to minus 1. So I'm setting n to be minus 1 just so that MATLAB enters this while loop at least once. All right? And if the user enters a positive number, they will not be asked again because n will be greater than or equal to 0. Enter positive number, minus 6. It asks you again. 8 it doesn't ask you anymore. Another way of doing it is to ask the user once. And then if they enter a negative number, you would keep asking them. And the first time you ask them, you would not print out any um, error statements. If they enter a negative number, you can print an error statement. Minus 8, invalid, enter positive number, minus 7, and so on. So it appears that um, MT is considered to be less than 0. <coughs> and you can print an OK at the end, just as it's um, just to make sure it's the same as the example. Okay. Now let's rewrite this function so we enforce the user to to input a positive integer. I'm not going to rewrite a new file. Let me just change this function to do that. So in addition to checking whether n is less than 0, you also need to check um, if, sorry, or n is not an integer. So how do I check whether n is not an integer? Tell me one way that I can check whether n is not an integer. So if I take the floor of any number, if n is an integer, I'll get exactly the same number n. If n is not an integer, then I will get a different number, right? So 4.5, if you take the floor, you'll get 5. And it's equal to 5. Sorry, it's not equal to 5. It's not equal to 4.5, then... Um, you'll keep executing this while loop. So the first portion checks whether n is a negative number. The second portion checks whether n is not an integer. And so long as one of these two are true, you will run this while loop. Another way of writing this uh, condition would be to check for the, neg the, neg the negation of that, which is n greater than 0, and floor of n equals to 0. So this says I want n to be greater than 0 and floor of n to be n. So I want n to be an integer. If this is not satisfied with this negation sign, then I will keep running the while loop. So there's an equivalence um, relationship if you say x and y, if you take the negation of that, it's equal to saying not x or not y. Okay. Equivalently, not x or y is equal to saying not x and not y. This is an important logical uh, equivalence that you guys should be familiar with and Sometimes when you're writing, when you're writing complex con uh, logical conditions, one of these may be 
easier to write. Okay. All right. You can use continue and break to uh, control when you want to continue running the while loop and you want to, when you want to exit out of the while loop. Remember I showed you the return statement where you can return out of a function. Similarly, the break statement breaks out of the for or while loop. Whenever MATLAB encounters a continue statement, it will go back to the top of the loop. And when, whenever it encounters a break statement, it will go um, skip the for and while loop and continue whatever you have after that. All right. When you hit continue, if you are in a for loop, you take the next value in the range and put it into the loop variable. When you are in the while loop and you continue, you check your condition again. If the condition is satisfied, you run the while loop. If it doesn't, you exit out of the while loop. All right? And you would, of course, usually put continue and break statements in if, else um, statements so that it's not continuing or breaking for all um, values of the uh, variables. All right, so let's um, do this exercise where you are given a while loop at the top that initializes the variable a to be x and it's checking whether a is not small y and a is not small n. So this str compare compares two strings and it returns zero if they are equal. So if if you already know that A will be a single letter, you can rewrite this by saying A equals Y. Um, this is actually not the correct way of writing it. While A is not equal to Y. Or A equal equal N. So you want to enforce user to enter a small y or a small n. Okay. If they don't, if if they enter something else, you will keep asking them. And let's fill in this body of the while loop so we get that desired behavior. So what do I write next? Excuse me, this might be an emergency. Hi, can I call you in a few minutes? Okay. All right, bye. Sorry about that. Um, I thought it was an emergency. It was not. Um, so I need to check whether A is equal to yes or A is equal to N. And then I would say break. Okay. So what I do, I create an input, place it into A. Check if it is small y or small n. If it is so, I break. If it is not, I would keep asking the user. Make sense? All right, so what did we learn today about speeding up your code? We learned that you should pre-allocate your variables, your matrices. Um, so in the first example, I am setting A to be an empty vector. And each time I execute this for loop, I am extending its size and putting the value that I calculate on the right hand side and extending the size of the box of A at each time. If I pre allocate A, it'll be faster. If MATLAB already has a function that does the same job, you should use it instead of writing a for loop. And in most cases, this one will be fastest. All right, any questions, comments? So there's an exercise for Thursday, um, which is available on the web. Let's take a look at it quickly. Um, so it was very similar to one of the functions that we that we wrote today, and you're asked to write my cumulative product that will find the cumulative product of the vector. Uh, v similar to the cumulative product uh, function that MATLAB has.
All right? So it will return a, a vector that has the same size. And as you go, you need to take the value inside the vector and multiply it into the next value in, the, in your output argument. All right? And when you initialize your output argument, think about whether you need to initialize it to all zeros or all ones. Since it's a multiplication, it may make more sense to uh, set it to ones, depending on how you solve this problem. All right, so the lecture.